Hello, and welcome to Tax Live, a podcast by the Tax Institute. I'm Robin Jacobson, the Senior Advocate at the Tax Institute, and your host of today's podcast. On the show, I chat with some of the tax profession's brightest minds, drawing on each guest's unique perspective to give you valuable and practical insights you won't hear every day. We hope you enjoy this episode of Tax Five. I'm joined by Liz Westover, FTI, a partner and national SMSF leader at Deloitte. Liz is responsible for the firm's SMSF service offering, providing compliance and advisory services to the firm's clients. She has extensive experience in superannuation and has strong capabilities in the technical and practical application of superannuation and associated tax laws. Liz is a regular commentator on superannuation and SMSFs and has been involved in superannuation policy development and advocacy, regularly liaising and consulting with government, regulators and stakeholders on technical, legislative and policy matters for many years. Liz is a Fellow of the Tax Institute, a Fellow Chartered Accountant, a CA SMSF Specialist and holds a Bachelor of Business from the University of South Australia as well as a Master of Legal Studies from the University of New South Wales. She's also the Chair of the Tax Institute's Superannuation Intensive Organising Committee, with the online intensive coming up, offering eight hours of CPD on the 26th and 27th of March. Liz, welcome to Tax Vibe. Thanks, Robin. Lovely to be here. Look, superannuation is always a moving area. It's always subject to so much regulation, constant changes, and it's always good to focus particularly on the SMSF sector, which does represent a large chunk of the market. So we're going to cover quite a few topics in this discussion today, but let's kick off with the caps, limits, and thresholds. Now, there are so many of them. And in our recent submission to Treasury, uh, the pre-budget submission, we note a number of things such as inconsistent indexation, the number of different caps and rates and thresholds across the superannuation sector, in fact, more broadly, let alone across the whole system. And when you look at tax and superannuation, there are so many caps and thresholds to be mindful of. We've also got challenges with certain caps being indexed and certain caps not. So can you run us through some of the recent changes and what we're going to see coming up? Uh, absolutely. Um, and we do have a, quite a significant change coming up around uh, indexation. It has meant an increase in the concessional contributions cap from 1 July 2024. But broadly, your comments around change. Change is our constant in the superannuation industry and it is frustrating. Um, this particular cap, the concessional contributions cap, is indexed with uh, via a WADI and our transfer balance caps, for example, is indexed against CPI. So we have this sort of mismatch. In some years we get indexation on one and not the other. Sometimes it's both and sometimes it's none. So uh, for this year it's the concessional contributions caps turn to get indexed, so we're seeing a, an increase in the cap from $27,500 to $30,000. It always goes up in those $2,500 increments, so $30,000 per annum from the 1st of July 2024. And because the concessional contributions uh, cap is coming up, the non-concessional contributions cap is always four times the concessional cap. So we now have a non-concessional cap of $120,000 from the 1st of July 2024. So uh, no indexation on the transfer balance cap or the general transfer balance cap. So that's going to stay at $1.9 million. And what does that mean? That's the threshold for which people's total super balance is for their ability to make non-concessional contributions caps. Uh, so I'm, I'll, I'll keep going on that one. I'm on a bit of a roll with these, um, these rate thresholds. But what that means is that the, the gap, so your ability to use the bring forward provisions for non-concessional contributions caps is always starts with the general transfer balance cap, so anything above that balance on the uh, 30th of June of the previous financial year dictates your ability to make non-concessionals, period. So if you're over that, that threshold, no con concessional contributions for you. If you are under that, then we start to see these... these um, uh, thresholds around your ability to use the bring forwards from three years, two years, or not at all. And that is set by the general transfer balance cap less the non-concessional contributions cap for the year. So notwithstanding that $1.9 million isn't changing, those thresholds or those, uh, those gap steps are changing. 
So it's now going to be, uh, and I've, I've written this down because so it's nice and fresh, uh, less than $1.66 million. Uh, you can use the full three-year bring forward provisions, so $360,000 um, in, in that, that year. Uh, if the next gap is $1.66 million to $1.78, you can do two years bring forward to do $240,000 worth of non-concessional contributions. 1.78 to 1.9, no bring forward, so just the annual non-concessional cap of 120, and then of course over 1.9, no non-concessional contributions. So no wonder it gets confusing when we sort of start looking at all these sort of thresholds and, and so on, but uh, uh, a, a renewed opportunity for people to make contributions. So when you look at the different ways of indexation, you referred to AWOTI, which is the, or AWOSH, depending on your pronunciation, the average weekly ordinary time earnings versus CPI. Yeah. Uh, look, we'd need to unpack all the policy decisions made many decades ago as to why some use one basis of indexation and other caps and thresholds use another. But if we look across superannuation, for example, the $500,000 retirement exemption limit has never been indexed. We have legislated changes to increase the SG rate, which we're going to come to shortly. And then we've got these other modes of indexation for these particular caps and I'm talking about transfer balance, of course, and concessional and non-concessional. It does make it very confusing. And while there is a limited amount of discretion where people do get it wrong, particularly in the case of concessional, non-concessional caps, it's not easy to navigate this. No, it's really not. And you've, you've got to stay close to your advisors. Uh, the ATO website is actually very good, uh, as is the ASIC Money Smart website. It's very good for information and updates and so forth. Um, I guess the other comment I wanted to make about indexation as well, because we know it's a big issue with respect to Division 296 tax, and we'll, we, I know we're going to be talking a little bit about that. I think because we saw CPI, we saw our inflation uh, really um, go nuts, it, it really uh, increased quite significantly, which means we had that increase in the transfer balance cap uh, two years in one year, effectively, and no one really anticipated that that would ever happen. So I, I believe there is a bit of a fear around automatic indexation because you do lose that control about when those thresholds actually increase. So um, uh, especially with Div 296, it, it, it's actually not a deal breaker for me. I know the industry is pushing very hard for some sort of automatic indexation and there is a lot of merit in that. But so long as there is an ability to index at future times, which there will be, and it might be every budget submission the Tax Institute does from here on in, there'll be a... Um, a, a call for an indexation of that cap, but uh, I don't see it as the be-all and, and end-all with respect to Div 296. I, I believe it will be indexed over time anyway. One area of particular complexity is the transfer balance cap, and we know it's designed to, of course, limit how much you can hold in this tax-free earnings environment in pension phase. But with the personal transfer balance cap, you don't automatically get the benefit of all the indexation when it does say go from 1.7 up to 1.9 million as it did last year. You have to then work out your personal or proportionate amount of that increase based on how much you've already utilised. And the more times this gets indexed, the more complicated this is going to be. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so whilst the general transfer balance cap gets indexed, you, you're right, the personal doesn't necessarily. And once you commence an income stream, you now have a personal transfer balance cap. So for someone who was fortunate enough to start an income stream 2017 with $1.6 million, um, that's it for them. They will never be able to start any more income streams, subject to commutations and so forth, but they will not be able to start new income streams because they have already met 100% of the cap as it was then. So it then becomes, depending on what your proportion of the cap that applied. So if I had only used 50% of the cap at the time, I would be able to use the remaining my remaining cap plus 50% of the indexed amount. So you're absolutely right. The more indexation we have, the more complicated it gets and the more likely it is we're going to create a spreadsheet around it to make sure that we actually get it right. Absolutely. Where would we be without the Excel spreadsheets? <laughs> exactly. All right, moving on to some release of data. Now, there are two aspects to my question to you on this. We've seen for many years data on what they call the tax gaps, and in particular the superannuation guarantee tax gap, and we can unpack that. But recently on the 22nd of February, for the first time, the ATO released data around illegal early access estimates. So in other words, they're estimating 
the extent to which they think people have uh, accessed their superannuation illegally and early. So this is interesting to draw some insights and I'm interested in your thoughts on this. Yeah, look, um, it's an interesting piece of work and, and I think it was delivered quite well by the tax office in a bit of a call to arms by the industry to, to try and, uh, you know, put this out. It wasn't a criticism per se and I thought it was just, um, uh, you know, really did come across as we've all got a role to play in making sure that we have a secure superannuation system. So that was quite welcome. Um, one of the interesting factors I thought about it was that the, the main body of work was around the 2021 year. And uh, I think the numbers were 350, sorry, $256 million, they believe, was illegally early released, which was actually declined from the, the prior financial year of about $380 million. Um, but you might recall 2021 was the year of COVID and we had a, a lot of people applying for release of their $10,000, in fact, twice over, applying for it. I, I believe there may be some numbers in there that are actually people who were reported as the legal early release, but it may have been that they just withdrew their $10,000 without waiting for the release authority from the tax office. So there's an element of that. So I'm actually very interested to see subsequent years' um, results. Uh, but also the tax office is doing a lot of work to try and stop illegal early release, as you can imagine. There's a range of activities, um, including review of registrants. So if they believe there's any risk factors around it, uh, they'll pick up the phone, potentially talk to the trustees, make sure they actually understand what it is they're doing and why they're doing it, uh, that type of thing. Uh, and they believe in the 2021 year they've stopped about $168 million from coming out of the system that might otherwise had they not um, intervened in that way. So that's a really good thing. I see that as a, as a real positive. But um, it'd be interesting to see some trends in, in future years and just make sure we're all doing our, our part doing the right checks and so forth um, to stop any of this illegal early release. There's support for the proposition that many of the funds that were involved in this early release were in fact newly established funds. Yeah, that's that's often the case. Uh, and in fact, the ATO sees late or non-lodgement of a first year fund as a significant red flag around illegal early release. Um, so you know, they are very keen to make sure that the right people are actually registering um, for these funds. Uh, and um, there is a concern that a lot of these first-year funds are actually as a result of promoters and scams and so forth. So they are using other means to be able to crack down on some of those promoters uh, as well to make sure that they're not encouraging people or, um, uh, you know, to set up an SMSF roll over their, their APRA-regulated funds uh, monies into an SMSF and then take a very nice cut for the, uh, you know, for the privilege of assisting them. So um, I'm, I'm no fan of promoters and um, scammers, so anything that they can do to shut that down. And, and it's probably worth a plug for tax office and ASIC have um, dedicated pages for people to be able to report these promoters and any scams that they actually see. You can do it anonymously if you if you would like to, by email, phone, whatever um, means you need to. Um, and in fact, if you're if you are in the, uh, a tax advisor or an accountant, um, I, I imagine that the um, the tax institute would help facilitate some of those reports as well. If there was really sort of any significant issues around that, I, I've personally seen the result of it where, where people have been encouraged to set up SMSFs, promised property with LRBAs and so forth, and the money's gone. It's just gone. Um, and uh, in, in a lot of cases, it's with people who didn't have money to lose in the first place or a lot of money to lose in the first place, nor do they have the resources to try and fix it or get the advice that they need or know how to engage with the tax office. So it, it is a big problem. And regulation aside, these are heartbreaking stories because it's people's financial future. The analysis also found that around $200 million of prohibited loans have been made by self-managed funds, but then around three quarters of this have been repaid. So what are you seeing out there when it comes to making loans to members? Uh, look, I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding. And again, this is sort of where the law just, you, you know, you've sort of got to have this uh, a, a bit of a knowledge and trust your advisors and get in touch with your advisors before, before <laughs> you actually go and do these things. But there's a general prohibition on SMSFs or super lending to members or relatives. But of course, it's called an in-house asset and there is um, restrictions on the amount of these in-house assets you can have. So a fund can have no more than 5% 
of the total market value of its assets in an in-house asset. So we believe that that number reported by the tax office includes people who would have gone over the 5% limit. So um, often when uh, when that happens, you've got a breach of the 5% limit. It is reported as a, it is qualified by your audit, it's reported to the tax office. But part of the uh, that process is actually putting a plan in place to repay it. So it's good to see that those plans are actually in place and are, those amounts are being paid back um, as they are required to do so to continue to comply with uh, with relevant law by the funds. So we know that this illegal early access estimate will be done on an annual basis from now on, but for many years we've always had this SG tax gap analysis. So what is this telling us about the difference between the amount of SG that the ATO expects should be paid and what is actually being collected by yeah. the funds? Yeah. Yeah, look, the, the numbers are still quite um, staggering. It, it really is a little bit frightening, and I, and I think that's why there is broad support for the new payday uh, super um, uh, regime and the me mechanics behind that, as long as we get it right. Um, and the, the latest numbers is that we've still got, uh, um, for 2021, the ATO figures was a gap of 5.1%, which means that people are still not getting the super guarantee that they're actually entitled to be paid uh, from their employers. Um, and that is that's a, a staggering figure, really. Um, and it's for a variety of reasons. I've, I've seen it in my own family where um, employers think they can call someone a contractor and so long as they issue an invoice, it doesn't matter that they're actually for every other purpose or every other, um, you know, look and feel that they're an employee, but they think because they call them a contractor, they don't have to pay SG for them. Um, and in my, partic my family's particular case is... Uh, please don't do anything about it, don't say anything, I like my job. So people get away with it um, simply by, you know, calling them a contractor. So uh, there's a lot of that and there's people who miscalculate amounts and then there is a cohort of, of other employees who simply do not remit SG for their employers. And they're, they're the ones I think we really need to focus on. Um, I believe the law needs to be better for people who make mistakes and it's not this sort of catastrophic um, outcome for people who make a mistake and the way the law is written at the moment is it, it, it is quite impactful. A minor error can be, you know, quite significant. But by all means, uh, anyone who's not paying the SG for their employees should absolutely have the book thrown at them. Uh, that Those deliberate non-payment um, should be dealt with appropriately. Well, whilst the figures, we talk about a gap of 5.1%, uh, the positive spin could be that nearly 95% are actually meeting their obligations. So 5% yep. doesn't sound like a lot, but the problem is when you translate into actual dollars, it's $3.5 billion in 2021 that wasn't paid in super. That's a staggering figure. Isn't it? It is. It's, it's an um, unbelievable number. Um, and when you think about that money that's not going in and the earnings that it could be doing and the way it could be invested in the meantime and, the, you know, what's being opportunities that are being missed by, by people who aren't having that money invested um, for them. So, yeah. Uh, a, a, we have a problem. We need to deal with it. And, and I believe there are things being done to do that. Yes, there are. We'll get to that shortly. I also add that this isn't a one-off year on anomaly. If we look at the last six years from 1516 through to 2021, which is the years that we have the gap analysis available for, the net gap was more than $3 billion in five of those six years. Yeah. So this is absolutely a trend. Yeah. It's not a one-off. Yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly right. We we need to do we need to do more, um, but I think the you know it it probably take time I guess for all of these measures to really take um, take effect. But uh, the impact that it does have on people's retirement savings is um, is huge. So if we can get that money in, the, it's less people on the age pension eventually. It's, it's more invested. It's better retirement outcomes. It's a win win. So let's move on to Division 296 and for the, uh, the we informed or those that haven't yet learned their legislation uh, references, Division 296 is a proposed new division in the Income Tax Assessment Act 97, which is going to tax the earnings that relate to superannuation balances above $3 million at an additional 15%. So it's expected to affect around 80,000 people initially from when it kicks in 1 July 2025. But... Let's unpack this a bit more because whilst it looks like a, a fairly small proportion of the population around, I think they're talking 0.5% in total, we've got obviously concerns about what happens in the future and the really big concern around this taxation of unrealised gains. So 
Um, yes, yeah, some observations from you on is this something to be concerned about and where are we at with this proposed measure? Yeah, it's um, it's a very hard one to uh, articulate, particularly in, in the media. And the first thing I'll say is that um, my observation is that for the most part people do not have a problem with an additional tax on earnings for people with high superannuation balances. Um, that is not the trend. Most people are very much on board with this. The problem that people have with it is the manner in which they are going to be taxed. And this Division 296 actually has very little bearing on an additional tax on earnings uh, for those relevant people. It is a, it's a brand new tax and that's the way that people have to think about it. And it is quite literally a tax on people who have more than $3 million at the end of a financial year, and that'll, that'll start from the 26th financial year. So we report balances on the 1st of July 25, then we report balances again on the 30th of June 2026, and if you've got more than $3 million on 30th June 2026, uh, we work out what your earnings is in that period, and if you do have positive earnings, um, then you're going to be up for this Division 296 tax. So by virtue of the fact that it's assessed against total super balance means it incorporates everything, including unearned income or growth in assets, which is just not a feature of our tax system and the inequity around that and the, the possible uh, where does it stop, um, what else are we going to tax that we previously uh, haven't taxed on unearned income um, is, a, is a lot of concern, not just in super but across the tax, um, the tax industry. So... Um, you know, there are other proposals that are going through at the moment. The Division 296 legislation has gone to the House of Representatives. It, not, it has not passed the House yet, um, but it has been referred to a Senate Economics Committee. They were due to report in April, and that has now been pushed back to the 10th of May for them to report back. And uh, whilst we believe that the law is going to get across the line, there is still hope on two fronts. One, that we see automatic indexation. And on the second one is that we see a different means by which the earnings is calculated. Because on this unearned income, we have this inequity around it, but there's also some very strange outcomes as a result um, that seem to be inconsistent with what we were going, uh, you know, what the government was proposing in the first place. So um, hopefully we'll see something different. I believe the uh, proposal is for uh, application of the 90-day bank bill rate that would be used instead of this change in total super balance to, to calculate earnings. Um, I'd have to say that's probably more broadly reflective of, of earnings. There'll still be some winners and losers out of it, uh, but it's probably more equitable than this change in total super balance uh, calculation. We're essentially using a balance sheet approach instead of a profit and loss. So instead of looking yep. at the actual earnings of the fund allocated to the member's account, and that could be spread across multiple accounts, of course, multiple super funds. They're proposing to use this movement in the balance sheet amounts and then assuming that any movement is attributable to earnings. But you could have movements in balances due to recovery of previously lost market value. And one of the ways I'm describing this is it's agnostic. It doesn't care if the movement between those two balances is due to a revenue gain or a capital gain or a discount gain or a non-discount gain, or a realised gain or an unrealised gain. It just says the movement with a couple of adjustments for benefits and, and also pension payments and any contributions is taken to be this earnings figure. And, and you could have these very strange outcomes where let's just say someone has $20 million in super at the beginning of the year, they get $2 million in dividends, interest, rent, whatever it might be, but the value of the asset actually declines by $2 million. So at the end of the start, you have $20 million. At the end, you have $20 million. You will pay no Division 296 tax, and yet that fund has earned $2 million in, in revenue. So that's really inconsistent, I think, with what we were trying to achieve through this. There's also some, some inequity around the starting date. So if someone has an asset that has declined in value quite significantly on the, and, and let's say that's what it's report on the 1st of July, or 30th of June 25, so their starting value is quite low, and that asset recovers in value. So by the end of the year, it's only recovered. It hasn't made money. It's just recovered. They're actually going to pay Div 296 tax on that recovery amount, and that to me is not fair. It's not fair at all. Um, and then, uh, sorry, we're looking at the impact on farmers, people with lumpy assets. They're, they're, how are they going to fund these new tax liabilities. 
So whilst all this, this income is supposedly in super, not everybody's going to um, uh, be able to access super necessarily. Uh, you do have a choice about whether you pay these amounts early or you get a release authority from the tax office to pay it from the fund. But again, if you've got lumpy assets and low income, your cash flow may make it very, very difficult to be able to pay some of these tax liabilities. So some, some big issues around it that I don't think have really been um, sought through. Um, I think it's been sort of pushing a means of being, being able to implement this policy. Um, again, like I said, policy no one's got a problem with. The implementation is what everyone has a problem with. I agree. It's the design. And you could have an, a, an interesting outcome where you pay your Division 296 tax on, let's say, actual earnings. Then the fund makes a loss. And we've been advocating with the other joint bodies to be able to carry that loss back to recover the yep. tax that you've previously paid through a credit or an offset or something. And that's not being um, supported at this stage. So you can carry a loss forward. But what happens if you then die, for example, or there was a peak in the growth of that asset and it never recovers to that value again? You will see these amounts of tax being paid on amounts that may never actually be realised. Correct. And if you are one of those people that sort of fluctuates above them below the $3 million threshold, one year you're in, one year you're out, how does that affect your losses and your ability to do it? It, it, it is. It, it's very strange how that uh, how that will actually work and there could be these just these losses that are lost forever, um, you know, gone, you're never going to be able to recover on them. So um, just for people listening, that is, that is the way it kind of works. If you think about it similarly to the way capital gains and losses works is that you you, if you have a loss, you carry it forward to offset against future gains. Well, it's similarly here, you carry forward those losses to offset against future um, future gains or future increases in your total super balance. So to let everyone know that we have been working very closely with the other professional associations across superannuation, tax and accounting, and we've put in joint submissions, we have been pushing for possible indexation of this $3 million cap. We've certainly expressed our concerns about the taxation of unrealised gains and also the fact that we can't carry these losses back. So they're the primary issues we've got with it. And, yeah, we wait to see what this does when it uh, comes back before the rest of the parliament. Yeah, I fear it's going to come through um, with very little change, but there, there is even still some very strange things in there. If you die before the 30th of June, you don't pay DIP 296 tax for that year, but if you die on the 30th of June, you do. Um, and it's a, it's a, a, it's got to be a drafting error, um, but doesn't seem to have been fixed in that period when it actually was presented to Parliament. So hopefully, in the final version, we'll at least get a change on that one to make sense. We hope so, and that's something that we did put in our submission to the Senate committee because that's completely anomalous that uh, a single day in an income year would be treated differently from any other day in that year. <laughs> exactly. All right, so moving on to the SG rate, we've seen it increase in recent years. It's currently setting a course at 11%. What's going to happen to the rate next one, July? Uh, so we're going up by another half a percent um, from the 1st of July uh, 24, and that'll be the second last one before we go to 12% uh, from the 1st of July 2025. So we're nearly there in terms of getting to the, the, the 12%. Uh, the interesting thing is, is watching this interaction with um, maximum contribution space and whether that, what indexation that amount will be. So we haven't seen the release of the new contribution space. So for the current financial year, any high-income earner is, is pretty much having SG that takes them to the um, concessional contributions cap. So for next year, with the cap going up to $30,000, we'll be just watching to see what that maximum contribution space actually goes to as well, and if there's any opportunities there for people to top up uh, employer contributions. And for anyone who's concerned that it seems that the maximum contribution base is indexed faster than the concessional cap is indexed, the law does contain a built-in mechanism. And what this does is basically limit the maximum contribution base to the concessional cap if it actually ever reaches that point, which it may well in the next few years. That's exactly right. And that makes perfect sense for it to be that way because you do not want employer contributions from one employer causing you to have a breach of the concessional contribution space. We, yes, we've got some built-in stock gaps there, thankfully. Yes. And a reminder that when these particular rates keep going up, so 11 and a half and then up to 12 over the next year or so, that increase is based on when the payment is made, not when the work is done. So employers can get confused about which rate they should be applying to which salary and wage payments. It's complicated. <laughs> it is. 
All right, payday super. Look, there's so much we could say about this, but just in a, a few short minutes, what's happening with this? Um, certainly the Tax Institute and other bodies have been heavily involved in targeted consultation and, and that does continue. And we do expect to see some draft legislation and a bill later this year. Plus, we're being told that there will be some further announcements in this year's budget. But what does this mean? What can we expect in the, the year or two ahead? Yeah, so I think there's still a lot to happen and there's a lot of um, productive consultation. I know, Robin, you're, you're very heavily involved in a lot of the consultation that goes on, which makes sense, right? We want it to be to make sense, to be practical, to um, anticipate any of what would otherwise be unintended consequences of changes in legislation. But it does mean that there's a lot of systems and processes that need to be built before this, this is implemented. So I, I believe it's we need at least 12 months or a clear year to allow um, payroll providers and super and employers to get their systems um, up to scratch to be able to, to kind of deal with it. But at the end of it all, it just means that contributions into super will be made at the same time as the, the pay cycle. Um, for employees, again, that makes sense. They can have better line of sight of amounts going in um, for them and there'll be more reporting to make sure we can identify where those amounts are not actually being paid. So um, I think it's fantastic legislation. Uh, as we know, the, um, the proof is in the pudding, so we'll, you know, we'll have a look at the legislation when it finally comes through. But I, I do believe there's some um, really good people doing some really good things in this, this area to get the right outcomes. Yeah, and look, we do hope the right outcomes are achieved. It is a great opportunity to streamline the current penalty rules and also to overhaul the disproportionate penalty outcomes we see on employers, where someone who pays just one day late is treated exactly the same as that really egregious employer who never pays the super. And we would like to see a, a lot more proportionality coming in there. Absolutely. And I think it is that opportunity to rewrite it, the legislation. It's it's always been clunky. It was hard to work out. It was easy to get it wrong. So streamlining it and making it easier to understand and easier to comply with is going to avoid a lot of problems for employees in and of itself. Not least of all, the outcomes is that people get their money into super faster, you know, with, with greater clarity and uh, and you know, earning um, investment earnings faster. So that, that's a good outcome. The two major things that of course need to be considered, apart from all the technical interactions with other parts of the law. The cash flow impact on employers who do pay quarterly at the moment, um, they will notice, of course, a big change in the impact on their cash flow. And secondly, the timing of all this, it is a 1 July 26 start date at this stage. Now, that sounds like a long way off, but there's an awful lot of work to do in the meantime. Plus, we have a federal election that on my reckoning would need to be held by May of next year at the latest. And then we know that the digital service providers, those designing the software, want an acted law in place for at least a year so they can invest and design the systems that are needed in order to implement the new regime. So it will be an interesting couple of years. There is a lot to achieve and it sounds like a long time, but it's actually going to be gobbled up pretty quickly. Agree, agree. And I, I don't blame them for wanting legislation in place and oh, agree. to do it. It's, uh, you know, when things can change so quickly, so rapidly for a developer, I imagine that would be a, a big problem until you've got absolute certainty. Um, but it's similar, you know, even with the Division 296, where we're talking about it, we're raising it with clients and so on, but at the end of the day, don't just hold back on acting until we've got legislation. We know exactly what it's going to look like. And just in a completely different sphere, Liz, we've got the $20,000 instant asset write-off threshold for small business entities. For the current income year, that is 1 July 23 to 30 June 24, we're now sitting here in March. And that bill is still before the Senate, oh, interestingly yeah. caught yeah. up with some measures of non-arms length income. So we talk about having certainty for taxpayers and yet we're, what are we, eight months into this income year and we still haven't got certainty on that particular measure. Wow. Wow. Yeah, not ideal. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. So um, where do we go to from here? You've got your event coming up. Um, we know, of course, there's lots going on in this space. And I thought something that um, is of interest, which you might touch on in your session at the superannuation intensive, the amount of money sitting in super now, of course, continues to be published every quarter. But what are the current figures for the self-managed fund sector? Amazing. We've, we've cracked the nine, $913 billion in self-managed super funds, which means the SMSF sector itself is not far off cracking the trillion dollars. 
Uh, so it's it's amazing amount of money that is sitting in our sector and just shows the importance and the, the criticality of what we do as advisors um, for our clients to protect those monies and encourage you know good retirement savings outcomes. So uh, amazing, and I, I think the number was uh, six hundred and December twenty three figures six hundred fourteen thousand SMSs or just over that number. Um, so we continue to increase in number and assets under under management and so on. So uh, very healthy sector, um, but the bigger it gets, the, the more critical it is for advisors to stay up to date uh, and back to attending things like the superannuation intensives just to make sure that you're, you're getting the latest on some of these strategies and measures and, uh, um, you know, changes in our, our legislation. Liz, I get very excited about tax, but I think you get even more excited about superannuation. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Look, thank you for your insights and um, I'm very interested to uh, hear your session and hear your insights at your session at the Superannuation Tax Intensive coming up in March. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tax Vibe. I've been chatting with Liz Westover, Fellow of the Tax Institute, Partner and National SMSF Leader with Deloitte. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate and review Tax Vibe wherever you listen. We welcome any feedback and suggestions. To catch all the latest from Tax5 and the Tax Institute, join us on LinkedIn. If you're interested in being at the centre of the tax conversation, a membership at the Tax Institute could be just what you need. Stay current and connected with tangible, real-world benefits. Learn more at taxinstitute.com.au. Thanks again. Until next time on Tax5.